Welcome to Marxism Today. I'm your host, Red Wagner. And I'm Tony Schmidt. And Tony. Yes. Last week, we posted our Sanders episode. I guess by the time this airs, it will be two weeks ago. Yeah. But we po- our last episode we posted was our episode on Bernie Sanders, which has gotten shared a few places. Mm-hmm. Yeah. First of all, let's talk about Facebook first. Okay. How did it get shared on Facebook? Well, we put it up, of course. Not that that gets us much traction, uh, but the DSA National page put it up very nicely of them. Yeah, which was, I was super psyched when you told me that. But then, you know, I don't, I know this theoretically, that internet comments are the worst things in the world, objectively. But actually, there's a lot of places on the web where you can get really intelligent, thoughtful comments from real people. And I guess I just spend a lot of time on those things rather than on the awful comments. Because I realized, you actually told me about the comments. Yeah. I hadn't read them yet until you mentioned it. I think, I'm going to go out on a limb, I think that... Facebook must not let you comment on something uh, if you've actually read or listened, in our case, to the link. I don't oh. think I, I don't think a single person did. Who That's not true. On I it. commented on it. So. That's true. I, by default, listened. Cause... So it is technically possible. <laughs> Facebook has not set up that filter. Yeah, Facebook isn't the best. That's why I like the Reddit. Like the comments we've gotten on Reddit about stuff are are quite good and I really enjoy those. But yeah, the the Facebook isn't the greatest. I was very surprised to see to sum them all up, it was don't equate Marx and Bernie Sanders because that is fuel for the right wing. Yeah, a lot of people were really upset that the word Marx and Sanders would appear in a post together. Yeah. I mean, we our the name of our podcast is Marxism today. I'm not sure if they picked up on that. I don't uh, think or the, so. I mean many of them didn't know it was a podcast cuz they <laughs> cause called they, it an article. Yeah, cuz they called it an article, which maybe they just don't know the lingo. I'm I don't think so. I think they just didn't know what they were saying. But like if you understand that that's the name of our show, you're basically saying that our show is not allowed to have an episode on Sanders. Yeah. Which, I guess you can have that opinion, but you're wrong. Yeah. There was one guy who, uh, I think, was was pro-Marxist and wanted, wanted to make sure that everyone knew that uh, Sanders was not a Marxist, but just a, a mere social democrat. Yeah. And... and I mean, maybe he thought he was correcting us, but that's exactly what we talked about in the episode. So, eh, yeah. I guess he, if he would, if he took the time to listen to it, he probably would have agreed with us and liked it. Yeah. So the other place our podcast was shared was on a subreddit, and we are no strangers to subreddits, as we've got our own subreddit and the socialism subreddit we sometimes appear on, and and the communist one, and, and so forth. Uh, but we we got posted to a new subreddit that I didn't even know existed. The Sanders for President subreddit. Right. Which was interesting. If you remember our last episode, we didn't start talking about Sanders until probably 20 minutes in. Because we talked about like label, labor theory of value mm-hmm. for a good amount of time. Which is good for people to know. <laughs> yeah. I think. Right. But I'm glad that we were shared there. It didn't spur a ton of discussion, which is interesting. I think that that's – I preferred the subreddit. Yeah. You know, because 
people stated things that other people might want to know. Like, if you want to skip to the Sanders part, go, whatever, 17 minutes in. And I forget what the other comment was. What was it? Oh, yeah. Eh, it suffered, the second one was, was suffered from the same problem about someone specifying that Sanders is not a Marxist. And then someone pointing out that that's exactly what we talked about. But... At least somebody called them on that one, I think. Yeah, that it was. There was someone that did that, and then the person admitted to have not read it, and just you know felt like they wanted to make that point just based on the title, which is fine. But I felt all in all, the Reddit conversation was far more civil and level-headed, yeah, and helpful. Yeah, the one on on our subreddit, I thought there were a lot of good comments there. Oh, I don't know if you. You saw those. No, let's let's take a look. Do you want to share any in particular? Um, I will share. Somebody replied back to... Actually, it looks like they went point by point for each of the things you asked for comments on. Wow! But I, I will read their first one. It's from Revolutionary DS is the person. Um, and they said that labor theory of value doesn't apply to what you call unique objects because Marxist theory deals with social relations that govern the production and circulation of commodities under capitalism. A system of generalized commodity production, labor theory of value, requires that there be socially average necessary labor time that goes into commodities production, and completely unique object doesn't have that by definition. Yeah, I thought that was a really... That answers that very, very well and concisely. I I liked that a lot. So I thought I would share since I thought it was good. That is good. Although, my question is, how unique does it have to be to be unique? Because I still think things like production of a software application can be generalized to an application of this complexity level and therefore can be because otherwise everything a journalist does everything a playwright does like there's lots of jobs that fall into that category right that are unique yeah but journalists the articles are reproduced yeah and so are plays the productions are reproduced as well as the yeah but that reproduction for a play is the production value of the company that, like, is doing the work to reproduce that play. Yeah, but the actual, like, manuscript of the play that they purchase... Yep. That's reproduced. It's just like a book, then. Yeah, yeah. Of yeah, course, everyone that very, writes a book, A very thing. poorly selling book. Yeah. Well, uh... I don't know, I, or, like, recording uh, an album or whatever, right? Like, you... Every album is unique... But if you just generalize it to, well, it's a basic rock and roll album, it'll probably take this much labor time to produce, you need people with this skill level to play the music, blah, blah, blah. Uh-huh. Well, if, if we're strict about it being unique, we could say, well, that doesn't fit into labor theory of value. You can't assign a value to recording a rock album because it doesn't fit into labor theory of value. I think that for unique for that purpose, because I think you're talking, I think that falls into the concrete abstract differentiation between like concrete labor and abstract labor. And I think that all unique can only apply to something just completely irreproducible, like even by the person doing it. Like, like the Mona Lisa. You know, could Da Vinci paint exactly the Mona Lisa again? Is an example. Okay, maybe he could, but he didn't, you know. <laughs> That's a good question. Well, like, like artists, what if we found well, the like second artists, Mona Lisa by Da Vinci? <laughs> artists who try and make money on their stuff make a copy and then will make prints and sell that. So it's the that's the reproduction of there for that stuff. So, like, sort of the old masters who didn't do that, you know, that stuff is unique. Although... Then what if you want to just generalize it as painting? Yeah, like a painting of this quality. Now, when you get up to Mona Lisa quality, then I think there's like all... It's not like just a painting that's like th of this quality. It's got like all the like historical importance behind it and everything like that. But like okay. the guy that does caricatures on the street, 
Yeah. Those are technically unique, but but you know that like a caricature costs whatever forty bucks to have him like make a caricature of you and your family. Okay, here's something though for you. What about saying Da Vinci doesn't count because Da Vinci wasn't producing commodities? He wasn't producing paintings for mere exchange. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm okay with that because. Whereas your modern artist is making art as a commodity, typically, if that's how they're trying to make their living, they're doing it specifically for the commodity's sake, whereas artists on sort of the border edge of early capitalism were still producing art for aesthetic or sometimes religious things. Even though they might have been paid for it, it wasn't the... They weren't producing a commodity for the sake of commodity production. So are you saying labor theory of value applies to modern artists, but not to Leonardo. Yes. Depending on what he's making. I mean, because if he was told, you know, I don't know. It could, it's tricky with that. Yeah. Because you could almost call all painting handicrafts. Like, still fall under the system, or all, like, artwork, fall, or all painting artwork artwork falls under the old handicraft system still. So in that sense, it's an an, an anachronism in capitalism today. But it's still commodity production. Because generally, an artist like on the street owns his own means of production, or her. So there's not a capitalist out there exploiting them for surplus value, but they're still creating a commodity to sell. Yeah, because you can have commodity production without a capitalist economic relationship. You can have self-proprietors or whatever. Yeah. You have individualized commodity production. Maybe that's different than what people mean when they say generalized commodity production. I'm not exactly sure what that means, if it's just how widespread it is or if it means under capitalist relations. I don't know. Maybe we're talking too much about this. Yeah. We we should maybe we should have a whole another episode. A whole we talk episode about this. The entire a whole time. episode where we ruminate on theory that we just think through. Yeah, or we could I don't know. We could read about it beforehand. Ah, that's no fun. I discover somebody's already answered the question. <laughs> when was Da Vinci? Oh yeah, there we go. Fourteen fifty two to fifteen nineteen. So that is before the advent of capitalism. Oh, Leonardo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're still in the mercantilism, which... Does labor theory of value only apply to capitalism? Because there's all sorts of texts where Marxists will point out that, like, labor time has been used in all sorts of economic systems to... I think the labor theory of value that Marx develops applies only to capitalism, but you can use parts of that theory to analyze and develop a, your own, a different theory of how labor works in other systems. Uh, so but like I think the, the labor th- thing... theory of value as it stands only works with capitalism, com- capitalist commodity production, precisely because there's the use value and the, uh, you know, exchange value that you have to have a laborer that only has their own labor to sell. And he, you know, he talks about the feudal system and slave systems as well. He talks about other systems, but It's different because they're not producing commodities. Because, oh, that was, I was recently watching through all of Brendan Cooney's videos on the labor theory of value. And I think he was the one that pointed out that after the Soviet Union introduced the conveyor belt, they changed other textbooks to say that the labor theory of value also applies to socialism and communism. I'm just reading this. I love what this guy wrote. The. I, I, must, I think I asked at the end of the last episode what people thought of Sanders. And that, that same commenter you mentioned earlier says, of, of course Sanders is the best thing to happen in American socialism since Debs. Anyone who thinks otherwise is either brain dead or hopelessly sectarian. So this person full heartedly agrees with us, which is uh, fun to see. So, I don't play a lot of video games, but Tony, you mentioned... This uh, new, what would you call a new version? It's not really a new game. 
Uh, it is a new game. A new game, but it's, it's within a series of well-respected games. Yeah. So they announced a couple weeks ago, probably, a, I'll say, like a month ago or so, by the time this comes out, uh, the next in the line of Assassin's Creed games, and the next major title is Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Exciting, I guess. Um, I don't know. I'm still on Unity, which is interesting because that one takes place during the French Revolution, which is fun to run around during that. They called it Unity, and it took place during the French Revolution. I feel like there were three. There would have been three really good choices to call it if I were naming it. For the French Revolution, you'd say equality, brotherhood, or death, right? They already oh, had or, one called Brotherhood. Oh, did they? <laughs> they yeah, they already had an Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. Mm-hmm. Um, Egalite. So that, that one's out. They have uh, one called Assassin's Creed Liberty, I believe, as well. <laughs> oh, a smaller yeah. one. So that's another one out. They decided not to call it Equality, though. No. And that, was ca- a, that was a deliberate choice. Yeah, well, it's called Unity because uh, you're an assassin and you're working with somebody who's a Templar and you haven't played the game, so I won't get into all of that with you. Oh, you need to, like, team up, though, or something? Yeah, you, you basically unite. work. Yeah. So the Knights Templar, it, like, still exists in those games, as well as your guys are assassins. So these games have, you know, their historical fiction, and they often have historical figures of the time, um, ones that take place in uh, Italy, ancient Italy, or not ancient Italy, um, medieval Italy, Leonardo da Vinci's in them, Machiavelli's in them. That's cool. Yeah. I think that's awesome. Yeah. Because yeah, I, we... I played video games when I was little, but there wasn't cool stuff like that going on. Oh, man, I liked those ones we played when we were younger. No, that's true. I mean, I had a lot of good times playing Super Mario Brothers 3. Yeah. Flying around in a raccoon suit. Tanuki. But... Tanuki suit. Oh, yeah, Tanuki suit. Which apparently are a real creature. Oh, for real? Yeah. They're... Is it a raccoon, basically? Yeah, it looks like the suit, and they're only in Japan, so go figure. Okay. That makes sense. Then. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, oh, like the first one, Richard the Lionheart is in that one because it takes place during the Crusades. Um, there's a really bad one uh, that takes place during the American quote-unquote revolution. I I need to find a... I want to find a better word for that. I'll call it the American Colonial Revolt? I don't know. You don't want to call... The American Revolution or Revolution? It wasn't a revolution. It was simply uh, changing the geographic location of the elites who were in charge of everything. Oh, I see what you're saying. That, like, those same people were basically in charge. But it made the formal change. Yeah. I don't know. It wasn't, like, a revolutionary change in system. It just went from, like, where there technically was a monarchy to getting rid of the technical monarchy part and more or less keeping most of the other structures intact. Yeah. I guess you could call that a revolution. I mean, I think you can call it a revolution even if the... Maybe I have too loose a term here, but I think even if you keep the exact same social and political structure, but you just change who's... Like, instead of these people, it's these other people now, but it's the exact same structure... That, I think, even still counts. It's not the kind of revolution that we're interested in as socialists. Like, we're most interested in revolutions that change the structure. But isn't it still called a revolution? What about, like, the War of the Roses, then? Where it's, like, different royal families or noble families vying for the crown. Like, would you call those revolutions? Yeah, I guess there's, like, coups... And then there's revolutions. Yeah, see, now we're... Would, know, whatever. Would, would you rather call it the American coup? Ah, no, because they're not take. They're only taking over part of it. They're not... Like, if, if George Washington then became the head of the English Empire, yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'm, that's a good point. Because there's still King George. Yeah. Maybe... Whatever. Maybe let's just call it the American Revolution. Okay, I'll well, to... everyone knows what that means if <laughs> yeah. you say it. Say something really confusing that nobody knows. Make up my own thing that nobody cares about. Um, so, American Revolution one, um, which I did not like, uh, 
there's a lot of really bad I don't know. I don't know why that game was so much worse than the other ones, but it was. Um, like Ben Franklin's in there, George Washington's in there. Um so one of the last parts I haven't beaten that one because one of the most painful parts is riding with Paul Revere and you gotta knock on people's doors and be like the British it was <clears throat> anyway, setting aside game critiques. So they have, you know, eminent thinkers and important people in the times and locations. Wait, wait, of wait. Them. You're saying that it's not an exciting game to knock on doors and talk to people on their front stoop? Yeah. This is not going to bode well for my upcoming <laughs> video game about canvassing for a political candidate. Uh, hey, Paperboy did well, though. That's true. Except you biked and threw things at stoops. Yeah, you can take almost any mundane task, and if it's like becomes a, like a dexterity challenge or whatever, or like a timing thing or something, it's instantly a good game. Like, remember in Mario Paint, there was a game about swatting a fly? Vaguely. Yeah. That was fun. I had a lot of fun swatting flies. So this new newest one that they've announced... Oh, yeah, the French Revolution one, I guess I should say, has, you know, Robespierre's uh, kind of a bad guy in that, and they have Louis and Napoleon. I haven't beaten this one yet, so I'm not sure how they fall in Napoleon. Oh man, I want to know pretty, now. Yeah, I know. I gotta. I shouldn't be doing this. I should be sitting in my basement playing a video game. Um, <laughs> instead of my basement recording podcasts. <laughs> yep, yep. I should just brought it. And we could have re- recorded me playing. Going, damn it! I died again. So yeah, it's interesting. The uh, they're not like negative towards Napoleon, at least at this point. Oh really? Yeah. I'll be surprised if it comes out as a pro-Napoleon game. I will be too. Um, but anyway, so yeah. So they have lots of famous people of the times and places that they're... So this next one, Syndicate, is in London in 1868, where the only real, like, I guess other than the Queen, um, the only big thinker or person I can think of was a German emigre by the name of Karl Marx who was there and I'll have to put up a link to the trailer but they talk about like the working class being oppressed and not sharing in the gains of industry and I was amazed when you showed me this preview for it about how much it is about class struggle. They clearly show class struggle as the main conflict in the game. It actually kind of comes off as a 1860s fight club. Yeah. Um, although I will say, they also could, and there's a chance that they might, instead of making it be about class struggle, they might make it just where the Templars, who are the bad guys, are all of the capitalist ones, and it's really... They're talking about the secret struggle against the Templars instead of the class system. But, I mean, you could maybe read that as one and the same, though, too. Mm. I just, you know, like, I don't think they're necessarily going to come out as a 100% pro Marx thing, like... No, Let's start the revolution because their sales last year were just over a quarter, three quarters of a billion dollars. I mean, they are Ubisoft, who makes those games, is in France, so or they're headquartered in France. So I mean, they're not necessarily anti any of that stuff. But I'm just gonna go with the big corporation. Is <laughs> not gonna be like, yeah, class struggle. Yeah, completely at least. I mean, it's surprising that a video game has gone as far as making it a topic. Yeah. I mean, it's I I will expect lots of mischaracterizations and misunderstandings of Marx and, and all that. But you know what? If they have Marx drunkenly walking around and throwing beer bottles at streetlights, that would be probably fun. true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, although, I mean, maybe the problem would be, I don't know if they had bottles for beer then. Oh, uh, that's a good point. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know when they started bottling beer. Because you couldn't transport it very far until, well, maybe about then you could. Because at first it never really went anywhere. Because it spoiled so fast, and then they came up with various things, 
like a really hoppy beer. Hops is a preservative. Yep. So it's added hops to beers that could travel a little bit more. That's why uh, Indian Pale Ale is uh, ale that was made to be sent to the British troops in India, hence Indian, and it's very, very hoppy. So You know where I learned that the... from? Where? David Harvey. Oh, yeah? Yeah. He, uh, he talks a... about that, too? Yeah, he goes on a tangent about it in his lectures. Yeah. Well, beer's good. Yeah. And the other big innovation in preserving, does he talk about this, too? I can't remember, is lagering. The Germans came up with huh. the bottom fermenting, or I said it at the bottom fermenting lager yeast that then fermented at a colder temperature and lager uh, has a better shelf life. Oh, really? Yep. Huh. Cool. Yeah, because you can store a lager, like, actually a lot of people do this with, like, fancy limited release beers. Um, You can store them, like, in a cool area, like uh, you would wine. For some, not all beers. Don't don't do that, and don't waste your time with you know like. Don't get like a case of Budweiser and put it in your basement for you know three years and expect <laughs> it to be a wonderful vintage. It'll still taste like it does now, which is not good. Speaking of beer, are you making any beer right now? I am not. I have to get on you... this. This is something else I need to. I need to play as some Assassin's Creed and come up with a beer. I'm going to do a. Uh, a Russian Imperial Stout. However, yeah, I have to bounce some names over. I'm not going to call it a Russian Imperial Stout. Or if I do, I'm going to name the beer Dead Romanov. <laughs> 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 Dead Romanov, a Russian Imperial Stout. And just, I don't know, I have like maybe a picture of like the Romanov crest with like bullet holes in it or something. Or maybe... Um, no, I won't do a picture of them. That's too glib. Uh, or call it, or have the Imperial crossed out and have Revolutionary written on there. And then, I don't know, put a picture of Lenin, maybe, or somebody. I don't know. You made, um, an Oktoberfest that was, uh... commie themed That was, yeah, that was Soviet-themed last year, right? Yeah, what I call it, the October Revolution... Yeah, I think that's what I called it. It was good, Revolution. Though. We drank many of those while... With a K. While podcasting. I think it'd be hard for them not to have at least a favorable depiction of him based upon the way of that they did that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, we'll see. Yeah, they might just have him be, like, belligerent and whatnot. I also think Mark's probably a bit belligerent. Yeah. <laughs> Based I mean, upon his fondness for polemics. Uh-huh. Um, I think he probably was a bit belligerent anyway. Although not as much as Engels, apparently. Oh, for real? Oh, yeah. A lot of other people, a lot of other uh, socialists at the time, thought that part of uh, Marx's problem, why he wasn't more prominent than he was, and why there were so many squabbles, was because Engels was so abrasive to everybody. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because Engels comes off as, like, very, like, orderly and, like, get things done and not, I mean, his, his writing comes off as just kind of matter of fact, not necessarily abrasive in any way. Yeah. Where, where Marx but is, He was kind like, of a bohemian dude, though, too, you know. Yeah. Living a drunken lifestyle secretly with his Irish lover. Hmm. So... And he had a fondness for fighting, too. <laughs> yeah. Marxism Today is created by Red Wagner and Tony Schmidt and is a project of the Democratic Socialists of America, Madison, Wisconsin chapter. We are not official spokespeople of the DSA and the views expressed in this podcast are our own. You can find us on Twitter at Red Wagner 2, that's the number 2, and Schmidt AJ, that's S-C-H-M-I-T-T-A-J. 
Our episodes are all available for download on our blog, marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com. You can share your thoughts about this episode and others on our subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash Marxism Today. Also, you can find information about the Democratic Socialists of America Madison chapter on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash DSA Madison. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.